Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Hare Krishna Today we're reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita as it is, chapter number two entitled Contents of the Gita Summarized and text number 60. Yatato yapi konteya Purushasya bilipas chitaha Indriyani Pramatini Haranti Prasabam Manaha Yatataraha While endeavouring He Certainly Api In spite of Konteya O son of Kunti Purushasya of a man Vipastitaha discriminating knowledge full of discriminating knowledge Indriyani the senses Pramatini agitating Haranti throw Prasabam by force Manaha, the mind. Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada. The senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a man of discrimination who is endeavouring to control them. Please repeat. The senses are so strong and impetuous O Arjuna, o Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away, away the mind, the mind even, of even of a man of discrimination who is endeavouring to control them. Who is to control them. Purport. Mm. There are many learned sages, philosophers and transcendentalists who try to conquer the senses, but in spite of their endeavours, even the greatest of them sometimes fall victim to material sense enjoyment due to the agitated mind. Even Vishwamitra, a great sage and perfect yogi, was misled by Menaka into sex enjoyment. Although the yogi was endeavoring for sense control with severe types of penance and yoga practice. And of course there are so many similar instances in the history of the world. Therefore it is very difficult to control the mind and senses without being fully Krishna conscious. Without engaging the mind in Krishna, one cannot cease such material engagements. A practical example is given by Sri Yamunacharya, a great saint and devotee who says, Yad avadi mama cheta Krishna padara vinde Nava nava rasa daman yudatam rantam asit Tad avadi bata nari sangame smaryamane Bhavati mukha vikara shushtu nishti vanamcha Since my mind has been engaged in the service of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna and I have been enjoying an ever new transcendental humor whenever I think of sex life with a woman my face at once turns from it and I spit at the thought Krishna consciousness is such a transcendentally nice thing that automatically material enjoyment becomes distasteful. It is as if a hungry man had satisfied his hunger by a sufficient quantity of nutritious eatables. Maharaj Ambarish also conquered a great yogi, Duvashamuni, 
simply because his mind was engaged in Krishna consciousness. Savai mana krishna badara vindayor vachamsi vaikunta gunar navarnavi. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshurun Malitam Yena Tasmay Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitanya Manobistam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Sayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Svaparantikam Vandayaham Sri Guruho Sri Yuta Parakamalam Sri Gurun Vaishnavamsta Sri Rupam Sagrijatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadhavetam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Padana Ralita Sri Visakan Vitam Sha He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namustate Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Vrindavaneshwari Vishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Bhavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Nama Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta, Swamini Namane, Namaste Saraswati Devi, Gauravani Pracharine, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi, Paschata Deshatarine, Isra Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadhara, Sri Vasari Gaurabhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. <coughs> Yatato apikontaya purushasya vipas chitaha indriyani pramatini haranti prasabam manahe ha. The senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind, even of a man of discrimination, who is endeavouring to control them. So this verse We've been talking about um, this for several days because this verse comes in the middle of a selection of verses uh, which is Krishna's reply to Arjuna's questions. So Arjuna asks the questions back in text number 54. He said, O Krishna, what are the symptoms of one whose consciousness is thus merged in transcendence? How does he speak? What is his language? How does he sit? And how does he walk? So the uh, Vishwana Chakravati Thakur has uh, rephrased these questions to help us in understanding. So what are the symptoms? It's just the general symptoms of one who's in transcendence. Because Previous to this, Krishna had been advising Arjuna to get beyond the flowery words of the Vedas and to get into this transcendental position, this position of buddhi yoga. So now Arjuna wants to know what this buddhi yoga are, is. So first, what, is, what are the general symptoms? Then he says, how does he speak and what is, he langu what is his language? So this Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur explains is how does he speak is how does he respond to others when you encounter others who are in the modes of nature how does he respond to that um, so we'll go how it's answered so the first question the general symptoms are answered in text number 55 when a man gives up all varieties of desire for sense gratification which arise from mental concoction and when his mind thus purifies finds satisfaction in the self alone he is said to be in pure transcendental consciousness. 
So this mental concoction again comes up in the purport to today's verse. Srila <clears throat> Prabhupada describes how people fall victim to sense enjoyment due to the agitated mind. So we can understand that this sense enjoyment is not entirely just driven by the senses themselves. The example given in this today's verse of Vishwamitra Bhuni, he w had been meditating for 60,000 years and he was agitated by sex desire. But what was that agitation? The agitation was in his mind only. He was meditating. He wasn't seeing Menaka even. He only heard her ankle bells. So this is how the mind finds something and attaches some meaning to it. So this is why this term mental concoction comes up. And similarly, we heard uh, yesterday how Sri Kalagya gave the example of Sobari Muni, who was meditating deep in the waters of the Yamuna, and he saw two fish copulating. So again, it was the mind that dragged his senses to think about sex enjoyment, because it was two fish. There's no actual pleasure to be engaged in looking at two fish, but the mind attaches a meaning to it. And that meaning is what drags the senses and says, I want this sense enjoyment. So this, this person in Buddha Yoga, this Stita Pragya, this person of steady consciousness, has given up all these variety, varieties of desire that come from this um, mental education. Um, Trila Trikalagya yesterday explained how Subari Muni eventually, after enjoying for I think a thousand years with his 50 wives, suddenly realized the futility of it, I mean gradually realized the futility of it, and came to his senses and became a devotee. So gradually he gave up this desires for sense gratification. So that was how does he respond, oh, that was the general symptoms. How does he speak, how does he respond to others is in text number 56 and 57. One who is not disturbed in mind, even amongst the threefold miseries, or elated when there is happiness, who is freed from attachment, fear and anger, is called a sage of steady mind. In the material world, one who is unaffected by whatever good or evil may, he may obtain, neither praising it nor despising it, is firmly fixed in perfect knowledge. So in this way, this is how he responds to the circumstances around him. He is not disturbed. He doesn't become angry. He doesn't become upset. He doesn't become happy even. He just accepts the situations that come to him. So that's how he speaks, how he responds. The next question, how does he sit? So Vishwanath Chakvari Thakur has explained that means how is it that he controls his senses? How does he sit peacefully and control his senses? So that happens and the answer to that is in text 58 to 59. The example of the tortoise is given. One who is able to withdraw his senses from sense objects as the tortoise withdraws its limbs within the shell, is firmly fixed in perfect consciousness. Though the embodied soul may be restricted from sense enjoyment, the taste for sense object remains. But ceasing such engagement by experiencing a higher taste, he is fixed in consciousness. So in this way he restrains his senses because he is fixed in consciousness. Now this section that we're in today is from 60 to 63 is a slightly different angle. It's not directly answering the questions. Here, according to Vishwanath Chakravati and Buri Jan Prabhu, here what's happening is Krishna is emphasizing, so you Arjuna, you wanted to become a Yani, you wanted to go to the forest, you wanted to give up fighting. So this is my response that the senses are stro so strong and impetuous, O oh Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a man of discrimination who is endeavoring to control them. So uh, the Acharyas again has said, 
that this man of discrimination, Purushyasya Vipastitaha, refers to the jnani. So Krishna is saying directly to Arjuna, you wanted to become a jnani, you wanted to not fight and not, fill, f not kill your guru, not kill your grandfather. But here is, here is the problem. Here is the defect of Gyan, because Gyan and the other forms of transcendentalism are before yoga. Um, yogi, the yogi, the jnani, and the karmi, they are trying, well the karmi doesn't try too much to control his senses, but still he does in karma yoga. They are trying to control the senses by regulation only, by force. But actually it doesn't work. Vishwamuni was a very great yogi. The example of Yamanacharya was is actually a very nice example because although it's, it's not such a great thing for uh, advanced devotees to give up sex life, actually Yamanacharya was previously a king. So he was a kshatriya, so he was accustomed to this type of enjoyment and yet he gave it up because he found this higher taste um, that Prabhu spoke about in yesterday's class. Vishaya vini vartante nira harasya dehinaha raso varjam rasopyasya param drishva nivartate. So then this verse up to, up to verse 63 covers this question of the defect of jnana, how the senses are so strong that they will carry away the mind, they will carry away the person who is trying to control them. And the last question is from 64 to the end of the chapter um, how does he walk which according to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur means how is it that he engages his senses in the proper way and the answer is um, given by regulative principles so 64 says Raga Dvesha Vimuktestu Vishayan Indriyaischaran Atma Vesya Vidayatma Prasadam Prasadam Adigachati. But a person free from all attachment and aversion and able to control his senses through regulative principles of freedom can completely obtain the, obtain the complete mercy of the Lord. So the devotee, once he takes up this process of sadhana, he becomes uh, protected because he's engaging in the regulative principles of freedom. In this way, um, his senses become controlled, and this way is the way he walks, he engages his senses. So we'll look at a few things in today's purport. Um, some things we've come in, there's one sentence uh, that summarizes this need to control the senses. Um, Prabhu was saying also in the class yesterday how we can pretend to be a devotee but if we make no attempt to control our senses then what type of devotee are we? And what, in, what advancement we will make? If we say, okay, oh class but it's hot, let me go to Loi Bazaar and, and take my lassi and forget about class. I'm d I'm chanting, I've chanted my rounds, I don't need to do any more. So this is, what type of devotee is this? So, um, this, first, this uh, sentence towards the end of the first paragraph, without engaging the mind in Krishna, one cannot cease such material engagements. So Srila Prabhupada spoke on this selection of verses, he spoke on quite a lot of verses, but he covered this point through most of his class. And we're going to have to just find it. So in this selection of, of this um, class that he gave, he speaks first from yesterday's verse, from 259. He explains how we have to uh, go for this higher taste, but in order to get there we have to go through the regulative principles, we have to control our 
mind and our senses. Let's see if I can get there another way on this one. Okay, so this class was on 259 to 269. Um, the, last, the later ones he did very quickly, he just read through them. On April 29th, 1966 in New York. So he summarized that um, this, the idea of coming to Krishna consciousness is that we are trying to transfer our activities from the material platform to the spiritual platform. So he, he talks about how these are different angles of vision. And actually, they're quite completely opposing angles of vision. It's like looking in one direction and then looking in the other direction. In order to uh, go to the spiritual platform, we have to actually regulate the material demands so that we're not engaged so much in the, s in the material platform to get to the spiritual platform. The process of yoga, we talked about the jnani and the yogi. The process of yoga is to control the senses, but it's by a forcible means. Um, he gives the example of the so-called yoga societies, because he was even living and preaching within a yoga society in the beginning. And he says, I've seen them. They can't control the senses. Yoga means indriya samyama, controlling the senses. But I have seen they have no control over the senses. So if, it, if we are trying for spiritual emancipation, we have to turn away from the material side. If we give more stress to material life, then it is not possible to have spiritual realization or spiritual emancipation. So now, yesterday's verse, Vishayavani Vartanti, that this yoga system is a mechanical process. The yogis are trying to control the senses by force. But there is another process. Srila Prabhupada says, one process is by force, I am asking you. Do not do this. He gives the example, just like you're restricted from eating if you're sick. If you're sick, you're restricted from eating. Don't eat this, don't eat that. You might follow it for some time because you're sick. But you're just waiting for the time when you can taste it again. You haven't actually given up the taste. So one process is that by force I am asking you, do not do this. But another process is that you have become so much elevated you do not like to do it yourself, which is the example of Yamuna Acharya. He became advanced as a devotee and he no longer wanted to enjoy the things that he used to enjoy before because he had this higher taste. We're going to speak some more about that a little later. How even on the path of devotional service, we might fail as we're moving along the path. As we're taking up sadhana bhakti, we might fail because of this strength the mind is so strong and so uncontrolled. Even though we're trying to control the senses, sometimes we will fail. But ultimately, we will come to this point where we become steady in devotional service. Srila Prabhupada then says, even if there is some enticement, still I shall not fall because param drishtva. I have seen something which is far, far better enjoyment than this material enjoyment. So, somebody earlier this week, was it Shubha Krishna, gave the example of um, Giriraj when he was a brahmachari down in Mumbai. How Mr. Nir had tried to foil his, uh, his good standing by putting a prostitute in the car with him as they were going from somewhere to somewhere else. But because he was fixed in Srila Prabhupada's service, he, he was able to control and wasn't agitated. So this is an example how it practically works now. It's not just that we're hearing stories from the Bhagavatam about how it works for someone else, how it actually practically works for us. So in the beginning we must take up some control. Prabhupada says, if we're actually serious about attaining, we must take a spirit of sacrifice. We must give up this sense enjoyment in order to get the higher taste. 
The penance is that we engage our senses not in the process of sense gratification, but in the process of serving the Supreme Lord, dovetailing with Him. So Srila Prabhupada goes on to say, it's not that we don't eat, we simply we eat Krishna Prasadam. It's not that we don't hear nice things, we, we listen to the kirtan in the temple. It's not that we, we're not talking, we're talking about Krishna. We're engaging all of our senses, but we're dovetailing with Krishna, and that becomes the way to control them. Okay, back to the purport again. Another point in the purport, towards the end of the purport, Srila Prabhupada gives the examples, Krishna consciousness is such a transcendentally nice thing that automatically material enjoyment becomes distasteful. It is as if a hungry man had satisfied his hunger by a sufficient quantity of nutritious eatables. So, there is a verse that talks about bhakti in relation to nutritious eatables. We have in bookmarks. There's a verse in the 11th canto, uh, chapter 2, verse number 42, which Srila Prabhupada quotes a lot, which is probably what he's referring to in today's purport. Bhakti parashanu bhavu viraktir anyatra chesa chika eka kalaha prapadyamanasya yatashnata shush tushti pushti kshud apayo nukhasam. Devotion, direct experience of the Supreme Lord, and detachment from other things. These three occur simultaneously for one who has taken shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In the same way that pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger come simultaneously and increasingly with each bite for a person engaged in eating. So this example is if someone is hungry and they start eating, these three things happen. They're pleased because they're eating nice foodstuffs. They're getting nourishment because the food is going to their stomach and they're getting nourishment from it. And they're also getting relief from hunger. So this process of devotional service, it says for one who has taken shelter of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the same analogous three things happen. So Jiva Goswami has commented on this verse. He has explained the analogy as follows. Bhakti or devotion may be c compared to tushti satisfaction because they both take the form of pleasure. Our devotion for Krishna actually gives us pleasure, it gives us the satisfaction. Parashanu Bhava which means experience of the Supreme Lord, is similar to pushti or nourishment because they both sustain one's life. So when we get this from, from engaging in devotional service, we get some taste of what it's like to be with the Supreme Lord and that nourishes it, that sustains our life. And finally, virakti, detachment, and should apaya cessation of hunger can can be paired. So detachment comes with devotional service in the same same way that if you're eating, you no longer are hungry. But Jiva Goswami says there's a difference in this analogy because it's a material an analogy. It doesn't exactly align with bhakti. He says that for a person who's eating eventually they will have eaten enough that they don't want to eat anymore. But for a person who's engaged in devotional service, they can never be satiated with devotional service. They are never satiated. They always want more and more. So Jiva Goswami says, this shows that the transcendental beauty and qualities of the Supreme Lord are not material, since one never becomes satiated by relishing the bliss of the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada had said in today's purport, Krishna consciousness is such a transcendentally nice thing that automatically material enjoyment becomes distasteful. 
So then the word virakti is also commented on by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Tagore. So virakti means detachment as opposed to renunciation which is chag. And so Bhakti Siddhanta comments that this word renunciation is not really applicable because we don't actually have to put any effort into renouncing. We simply become detached. One need not give thought to renunciation for one uses everything in the proper way in service of the Lord, yukta vairagya. So we don't have to renounce anything. We've got some more quotes on that later, some nice quotes about how instead of seeing anything in a material way, we just see it and automatically we want to engage it in Krishna's service. So then in the purport it talks about the analogy of the good meal. How when someone is eating a good meal, they lose interest in everything else. They're no longer interested in what's on TV. They're no longer interested in what's around them. They're interested in devotional service. So this detachment from other things comes automatically. And similarly, as one advances in Krishna consciousness, one considers anything unrelated to devotional service an obnoxious disturbance. So this uh, comes towards the conclusion of this. One should not make an artificial show of renouncing the material world, like the jnanis. We don't have to go and stand in the Yamuna for how many thousand years he did we don't have to go in up to the Himalayas and meditate for 60,000 years like Vishwamitra Muni. We don't have to make an artificial show of renouncing the material world. Rather, one should systematically train the mind to see everything as an expansion of the opulence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, when we see the material object, we become eager to offer it to Krishna. We become eager to give it back to him. <clears throat> without the spontaneous hunger to engage everything in the service of Krishna and to dive deeper and deeper into the ocean of love of Krishna so-called realization of God or loose talk about so-called religious life is irrelevant to the actual experience of entering the kingdom of God in other words if we take up this path of devotional service seriously we won't give much attention to those transcendentalists who think they're taking up a path but they're not taking up this path they're on some other mentally concocted path and we won't care about them because we've tasted this higher taste and the last point made in this purport is a very nice point how According to Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, the path of bhakti yoga is so joyful and practical that even in the stage of sadhana bhakti, in which one follows the rules and regulations without an advanced understanding, one can perceive an immediate result. We know that. We, in, we get engaged in the kirtan, we enjoy the kirtan. We come to the temple, we enjoy the deities. We enjoy getting up for Mangalati. Once we get used to getting up for Mangalati, we enjoy it. We look forward to it. We get that taste even in the beginning, even when in the stage of sadhana. Um, quoting the verse from Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Iha yasya hariya dasyai karmana manasagira jivan mukta sayuchate. As soon as one surrenders to the Supreme Lord Krishna, giving up all activi other activities, one is immediately considered to be a liberated soul. Brahma Bhuta Prasanatma Naso Chati Nakunkshati so this is from the Bhagavad Gita, I think 1854 or something like that. Once we uh, take to this path, 
devotional service truly begins, we are already liberated. After the stage of Brahma Bhuta, Mad Bhakti Labhate Param, Bhakti actually really starts. In the stage of sadhana, we get this taste. We're not quite liberated yet. We still sometimes fall back. But sometimes we are liberated. We get this liberated feeling. So any other process has a goal of liberation. But bhakti starts from liberation and goes beyond it and goes to something much, much better. Um, as Krishna says in 1866, Sarva Dharman Parichaja Mame Kam Sharanam Vraja Aham Tvam Sarva Papebhyo Moksha Yashami Ma Suchaha As if one surrenders to Krishna, one is immediately liberated and thus begins his career as a transcendental devotee with complete confidence in the Lord's protection. Okay. So, uh, I'll just summarize from these notes. The theme of today's verse is that if we don't develop the higher taste that was talked about in yest yesterday's verse, Param Drishvani Vartate, there is no other effective way of controlling the senses. You won't find another way where you can be sure to control the senses. So this is Krishna's emphasis towards Arjuna, don't become a jnani. And the power of the senses must be understood. How strong these senses are. They're so strong and impetuous, they carry away the mind of even a man of discrimination. Um, we'll go on to more of that in the, in the verses up to verse 63. 62 and 63 particularly are about this process of how the mind gets carried away. So uh, we covered how this Purusha Shavipastita, this learned man, refers to the jnani, endeavoring to curb his senses by any means other than bhakti. On the strength of his own uh, philosophical understanding or mental conviction, it just doesn't happen. Um, the example of the power of the senses, how Vishwamitra Muni and very many other learned sages. We talked about Subhari Muni and there are many others as well. They fall victim due to the agitated mind if they're not on this transcendental path. The only way to control the senses is from the higher taste of Krishna consciousness and the example in the purport of Yamanocharya. And Krishna consciousness is on the transcendental platform. We talked about that how Krishna consciousness is different from material engagement, so it's even different from satisfying the hunger because it gives us such a higher taste. Automatically, material enjoyment becomes distasteful. Um, the analogy of the hungry man satisfied by nutritious eatables. And in the end of the purport, the example of um, Ambarish Maharaj, who conquered Durvasamuni, simply on the strength of his devotional service, even though Durvasamuni was such a, such, also such a great yogi. So at this point, we'll ask if anyone's got any comments, questions, or corrections. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Oh, the mic's behind you. You can pass it to uh, Prabhu. Prabhu over here wants to say something. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yeah, I think it was Shubha Krishna. So similar I see the devotees who are constantly engaged in Krishna service, so their mind is not disturbed. And when we see there are so many sannyasis also Prabhupada, then they do not control their senses. So how we can understand the mind is carrying away in this direction? So we take up this 
process of devotional service with very good intentions. It's not that the sannyasis took up sannyas in order to fall down. But we have to understand in uh, 2016 I went to the ILS in Mayapur. At that time there was an interesting um, seminar by one Prabhupada disciple who spoke about how a sannyasi in ISKCON is actually in quite a susceptible position. Like a traditional sannyasi who's a jnani, he goes and retires into the forest. He doesn't go out and mix with people. But our Krishna consciousness movement is a preaching movement. So our sannyasis go out and preach. Also in that ILS, there was a very nice class by Bhakti Charu Maharaj. He, he also spoke about the same thing. He gave an example. I think he said, uh, Bhakti Siddhanta had uh, so many sannyasis, not as many as we have, and not a single one fell down. But they didn't go out and preach. Where's their preaching movement? They didn't preach at all. But in ISKCON we had so many sannyasis, and they were very bold, and they went out and preached, and some of them uh, fell prey to the senses. Because to preach you have to go and talk to people, you have to try and um, interact with people. You have to get to know people to explain things on their terms. You have to get close to people. It is a susceptible position. So Bhakti Chara Maharaj, he said that, uh, yes, so we had so many sannyasis who have fallen down, but look at what Iskon has done. Look at this preaching movement. Look how powerfully everybody has preached. And if occasionally someone falls down, we also have this Bhagavad Gita verse in the ninth chapter, Apichet Sudaracharu, Bajatemam and Anyabak. How provided one keeps to the process of Krishna consciousness, um, he is to be considered saintly. There is another very nice verse in the eleventh canto where Krishna himself speaks. I, of, I think I've got it bookmarked as well. No but we know which one it is. Srimad Bhagavatam 11 11, 20 27 to 28 So this is eleventh 11th canto 20th chapter 20 to 7, 27 to 28 This is part of the Uddhava Gita where Krishna speaks to Uddhava He says <coughs> Having a f awakened faith in the narration of my glories being disgusted with all material activities and knowing that all sense gratification leads to misery but still being unable to renounce all sense enjoyment my devotee should remain happy and worship me with great faith and conviction even though he is sometimes engaged in sense enjoyment my devotee knows that all sense of gratification leads to a miserable result and he sincerely repents such activities so this is the same uh, mood as this verse in the ninth chapter which I think is around 9.30 isn't it? Apichet sudaracharo bhajate mamananyabak sadureva he mantavya samyag vyavasitos hisaha even if one commits the most abominable action if he is engaged in devotional service he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in determination. Now we shouldn't misuse this verse and say that anyone can do any nonsense and steal from the temple treasury and, and be considered saintly without repenting it. So what's said here is budgete um, mam ananyabak which means engaged in service, devotional service without devi deviation. So one who is like that, we might fall down occasionally, as you gave the example of the sannyasis who fall down. Because there are so many, uh, it's so much a precarious position. I was talking about this other seminar, 
he gave so many examples of how a sannyasi should do this and should do this and should do this and how a sannyasi in, in this con does completely the opposite because they want to go and preach they have to go into the community and they have to preach but they're doing so to please Srila Prabhupada so so long as they keep strong in their devotional service and there are examples of even who some who didn't stay strong um, I don't remember the names there was one sannyasi they talked about who went to Japan to preach and he actually fell away from devotional service completely but later after he left his body his sister came to the devotees and said the last thing he said before he left his body was Prabhupada you've come he sat up in bed and said Prabhupada you've come because Prabhupada had promised, if you go to Japan and preach, I'll pr take you back to Godhead. So Prabhupada came, even though at that time he was not in devotional service. So we take up this mood of preaching to please Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada um, it also says in that verse, oh, Prabhupada's class, he said, at times we will fail to control our senses, because the senses are so strong. We can't take it for granted. But at the same time, we're trying to please Prabhupada by preaching. And sometimes the sannyasis do fall down. It's, it's, it's regrettable, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that we're doing the wrong thing because we're endeavoring to spread Krishna consciousness to every town and visit, village to please Srila Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya. You want to comment for that? Anyone else comments or questions? Hare Krishna. Unless sense enjoyment is inculcated in the mind, mind won't get agitated. Uh, to by our uh, endeavor and perseverance, the sense enjoyment can be eradicated. No. Uh. Prabhupada says no. The Acharyas say no. The books say no. The example of Vishwamitra Muni is very good. He meditated for 60,000 years. Supposedly he had been controlling his senses for 60,000 years. But all it took was him hearing a tinkling of an ankle bell. So you can say his, his ear dragged him. But actually it was the agitation of the mind. His mind was agitated. So it's by, by force of our own endeavor, what's said here in these verses by Krishna it's not possible to completely control the mind we might do it for 60,000 years in such a yuga but it's not absolutely guaranteed even we might fall down in devotional service but if we get this higher taste then we won't fall down because then our mind stops being agitated the example was given in that purport in the 11th canto how like if we're really engaged in enjoying a nice meal, we're not disturbed by anyone, anyone else. If we've got this great plate of Mahaprasadam in front of us, somebody comes and offers us a toffee, we don't care less. But if we're hungry, someone comes and offers us a, a, a toffee, we might say, okay. Like that. Without filling our mind with this higher taste of Krishna consciousness, we can't guarantee to control the mind or the senses. Any other comment, question? Prabhupada says, purity is a force. That only the first class devotee who is rich to send persons Krishna consciousness, he is the only one can control this thing. Yeah. Because even the Madhya Madhikari has a chance to fall down. Yes. If he gets it to Because it's not purified. So purification is required. Yeah, even Bharat Maharaj, they said, was on the stage of Bhava. It's a very high stage. Anyone else? Anything else? Okay, thank you all very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai, Bhagavad Gita Ki Jai.